Hello and welcome to the Build Up brought to you in partnership with Ladbrokes. I'm your host, Damien Donoghue, and we're here to get you ready for the weekend's sporting action. Today I'm joined by former Ulster and Ireland forward Stephen Ferris to look back on the final weekend of Champions Cup group stage action, the round of 16 draw, and to look ahead to this weekend's United Rugby Championship Games, which is the last round of fixtures before the Six Nation starts. Um, Stephen. Thanks a million for, for joining us. How are you keeping? Yeah, not too bad. Thanks, Damien. Um, what a weekend it'll be like crazy. Some uh, unbelievable results, some comebacks, last minute drama. Um, and just amazing the way the whole format of the tournament this year with the 24 teams all still able to, to make the knockout stages of the last 16 and into the, the final weekend. So, um, yeah, a different format. Some people liked it, some people didn't. I think the players themselves probably didn't um, because you lose a game out of uh, out of the group stages, but it threw up a few surprises, threw up some crazy results, as I said, uh, and now we, we roll on to the last 16, which will be, um, I think, 15th to 17th of April is that first leg because um, it's a two legs in the last 16. So, yeah, a uh, great weekend of rugby. Great weekend to be an Irish rugby supporter, regardless of, you know, with all four making the, the, the last 16, it's, it has been a great weekend. But I suppose there, there were three teams, three Irish provinces out at the weekend, but we'll start with the only Irish loss, which was Connacht. They snatched defeat from the jaws of victory, losing the final moments to Stade Francais. What did you make of the game and the fact that Connacht secured a round of 16 berth, but only winning once in the, in the group stage? Uh, do you know what? It was the game that I was looking forward to the most over the weekend. Um, it had a lot riding on it. Obviously, the you know the Leinster Connacht draw that was going to come out of the back end of it, depending on what way the result went. Uh, I was actually out walking the dog. Uh, I'm walking the wee one in the pram along a, a towpath close by and <laughs> multitasking at its best with the the game on my phone, the dog in one hand and pushing the pram. Uh, with the other, so it was uh, it was good listening to Mike McCarthy and, and Brian O'Driscoll, um, you know, divulge that game, uh, digest that game as well uh, after the match. It was just end the end, helter skelter, red cards, yellow cards, lots of tries, uh, and I, I didn't think that Stade Francais deserved to win the game. Unfortunately for for Connacht, they uh, they they were missing a few lads in the front row, and and that was the decisive edge that the Stade Francais had. They milked a few penalties, got a few of those scrum calls. Wayne Barnes kept on uh, around the scrum and it, it let them off the hook, didn't it? So yeah, a brilliant performance by Connacht and they're through to the last 16. Um, the first time they've done that uh, for, uh, I think, I can't remember how many years or maybe it might even be the first time in their history, um, the knockout stages of the European Champions Cup. So it's a big day for Connacht, but it doesn't get any uh, easier for them because they've got Leinster now in the next round. Looking at the style that does um, kind of play, like it's it, it's very very nice on the eye. But is there a debate for maybe getting down and dirty and holding on to the ball in, in those closing stages because they had the winning of the game, particularly when they were was it thirty one twenty ahead? Yeah, yeah, they did have the winning of the game. They they keep on attacking. Um, they threw a couple of offloads, then they make it like a half line break, get them behind uh, Stade Francais defence, and then they force it again. And when they forced it two or three times in a row, like the two out of the three stuck, and then the third occasion there was a spilt ball. And I thought Connor Oliver and Jared Butler were immense, like absolutely immense, but just on the odd occasion, just forced it one too many times. But I think Andy Friend would rather his team did that. That's the kind of the way that they've been playing over recent years, just keep on trying to keep the ball alive, play with pace, play with energy. And um, you talk about closing the game out, maybe when you don't have a bit more beef in the front row and you know a couple of more experienced players in the second row to try and close games, close those games out, then, then maybe that's the only way that they know. And, and um, yeah, it, it, was, it was difficult to watch the last 10 minutes because the, there was still this feeling, even with nearly 80 minutes on the clock, that Connick could go down the other end and score. And there was a passage of play like four minutes from the end, and like it, it was just back and forth, back and forth, and uh, a really enjoyable game of rugby to watch. And and you know what, you got to give Stade Francais a bit of credit because they actually contributed to the the game massively, also with with how they approached it. And um, their defence wasn't brilliant, 
but uh, they they went from uh, they went wide from deep in their own half. They they challenged the Connacht defence. They lived off their mistakes. They went after the scrum. Um, so there'll be a lot of learnings from both teams to come out of the game. And uh, I'm just glad that they're they're both safely through safely through. Excuse me to the next round. Yeah, definitely both deserve it on on the weekend's action anyway, because the the, the entertainment was of of the highest order. Um, yeah. I suppose. Ulster rounded off a perfect pool um, with a narrow victory over Claremont at home. What have you made of their campaign as a whole in the in the Champions Cup, having come through, I suppose, on the right side of four tight encounters in the competition? Yeah, four really tight encounters. And I think a way to Claremont getting the competition off to a fast start, um, a great win. Um, Northampton at home, they, they could have ended up losing that bloody game in the last couple of minutes held on. I think they were 21-6 up after half an hour, 35 minutes. And that's just something that Ulster are very good at, is getting off to fast starts uh, and putting teams under pressure. And and yet again, against Claremont at the weekend, they were the ones that were leading uh, 34-12, was it, uh, on the scoreboard with, with 10, 12 minutes to go on the clock. Um, and a couple of changes by Claremont. You know, uh, Peno come off the bench, Lopez, Fritz Lee, Vamahina, um, you know, Raka started to come into the game. Alvaretti Raka started to come into the game, and you know, also just got a little bit loose. And you know, with all the experienced players that they're missing, Stockdale, Ian Henderson, um, you know, two proven international players. Uh, you know, Will Allison's out as well. Um, you know, Jordy Murphy in the back row. Uh, there, there's a long injury list up there, and, and hopefully they get a few of those guys back for their last 16 match which is going to be against Toulouse it doesn't get any easier against Toulouse but uh, I, fa- I fancy them against Toulouse you know no Ch- Cheslin Colby is going to be uh, playing for them he's obviously away to Toulon this season um, and yeah if they play well they get a, a few of those players back that I mentioned they'll give anybody a game and with uh, with uh, going away first leg they're certainly going to know what they have to do when they come back to the Kingspan Stadium um, the following week to, to get the result yeah when you, when you look at what Ulster have done through the competition, I suppose considering the injury list, what what they've actually started to do is develop a lot of experience with with, with new guys and w- with youngsters. Yeah, lots of young guys like Ethan McElroy has been a superb on the wing. Um, Rob Balakun, I know he missed the game because of a shoulder injury, but he's back playing really well. Jim Hume, you had a guy Angus Curtis who only made his fourth. Um, appearance for Ulster in the last two seasons. He started in the centre uh, on on Saturday against Claremont and played brilliantly, really, really good, fizzing the ball about all over the place. Uh, and of course, you know, last but not least, Mikey Larry, who's over 500 plus running meters so far in the competition, 23 line breaks made in the competition in only four games. He looks, I know he's a small man in stature, but he looks very accomplished under the high ball. Um, he doesn't really need a kicking game because he, he's so good on his feet. Get, you know, runs the ball back at every opportunity that he, that he can. Um, and uh, I think I put it on Twitter. He's certainly in for a shout of being one of the candidates for European Player of the Year. I know there's still a good way to go in the competition, but he certainly put his hand up for that in the opening four rounds. And yeah, lots of young blood coming through. And it's it's always been a talking point at Ulster Rugby about all these young fellas. Where are they all? You know, one or two come in, then they vanish for a season and then one or two more come in and they vanish where it just seems to be that uh, these five or six players that I just mentioned are, are getting really significant game time and proving that they are up to um, that level of rugby. So uh, very, very positive. And if we can just get a couple of lads back in the pack to give us a, a bit more beef getting into the last 16, then, you know, things are looking positive. Yeah, definitely. Um, Leinster and Munster dominated their final pool games demolishing the English opposition of Bath and Wasps, respectively. Both sides did what was necessary to ensure a higher seeding, but what did you think of their performances? I suppose maybe starting off with Leinster, um, you know, Bath is, it, it's a lovely place to go and play rugby, but when you play it that yeah. well, it's even nicer. Yeah, like Bath only won victory like all season against Worcester, a 14-man Worcester um, at that, and they nearly lost that game in the end. Um, obviously, upheaval there. Yuan Van Grand going there next season. Um, coaching set up all over the place. You know, Danny Cipriani signed for them. He's nowhere to be seen. Um, uh, yeah, it just it just feels like the club's uh, a bit at sea, doesn't it? Uh, and Leinster, what, uh, afflicted on. Actually, I didn't actually catch the start of the game, and it was 15 minutes in. It was 
five nil the Leinster was it or maybe it might even have been nil nil um in the first 15 20 minutes and then you know when Leinster got their noses in front the, the confidence of the Bath team dropped and uh Leinster you know put uh Montpellier to the sword the week before uh and they were not letting up they, they put on a really good showing Johnny Sexton playing well um Josh van der Fleer is just in unreal form at the minute Jack Conan Keelan Doris in the back row just functioning at a, at a high high level so yeah, really impressed by them, um, and you know, obviously them versus Connacht in the in the last sixteen. Uh, I can't wait for that one. I might actually go to go to the games, like just to feel the atmosphere, and obviously with all these restrictions that are are being lifted, um, crowds back in, and you know, being able to go and uh, have a few pints with a few mates uh, around Galway before going to the game would be uh, would be some crack. So yeah, I can't wait for April time for that. Yeah, are Leinster on the weekend's performance? Are are they the best team in Europe right now? Uh, arguably, of course. Um, yeah, I, I would say that, that that Ulster are certainly up there. Also, um, Ulster beat Leinster in the United Rugby Championship only a number of weeks ago. Um, Monster obviously performing very well in both competitions. I still just don't see this ruthless Monster of old. Um, they did play quite well at the minute. I know we'll move on to that game, but. Yeah, Leinster, uh, like even speaking to other coaches um, in the United Rugby Championship and uh, speaking to a good few of them throughout the course of the season uh, in different podcasts. And, you know, they say that the Irish sides are the benchmark. And like if you're talking about the Irish sides and Leinster are the best Irish side, so they have to be uh, the benchmark. And um, maybe the likes of Toulouse on their day, um, if they have everybody fit. And we know La Rochelle can bring you know, a high intensity game when they want to. And, you know, Harlequins, obviously Gallagher Premiership champions, but they didn't look brilliant against Cast. You know, a last minute Don Brand try got them over the over the finishing line. Uh, so yeah, for for me you're probably right, Leinster and I I I'll go as far to say as as Ulster up there too. Yeah, definitely it, it it's looking like it can be because with all four sides on the one side of the of the draw of the last 16 draw it'll be only one side or either side can make the the final obviously so it'll be interesting yeah. to see how they they come apart Munster winning 45 7 against wasps um was was this performance coming in the last few weeks i heard it, the kind of the analysis being that you know you could see glimpses of of this performance in the last few outings although the the Munster supporters didn't feel that confident going into it yeah I think looking at the scoreline, you kind of go, oh, was this performance coming? But I wasn't that impressed with it, to be honest. Like, I, I thought Wasps were really poor. Um, like, Gavin Coombs picking off the base of the scrum, just running through the out half, and then one phase later, uh, O'Donoghue touches down. Like, that schoolboy rugby stuff, like, where, uh, you know, you practice and training, and, and then it, it, it comes off. Like, it's really poor defence. Wasps were all over the place. Um the heart wasn't really in the game. I don't think it was a really stop-start game. I know it was 40 odd points scored by Munster, but like if they had been ruthless on their day, you know, a few years back, I think I could have been more like 60, 70, more of a Leinster scoreline, to be honest with you. Um, the only the positive that I see from Munster is that I feel there's much more to come. Like, you know, if you're running games by 40 points, like happy days and you're doing that, and you're not playing brilliantly to, to the best of your ability and, uh, as a team, then that's that's a good that's a good sign. Like, and I know there's been huge pressure coming down on Van Grand. I think it was all more or less uh, Damien down to the timing of when he said he was going to be leaving to go to Bath, and obviously Bath hadn't won a game at that stage. And they're like, well, "Why on earth is he going there?" I thought he's dedicated to Monster. Anyway, we've crossed, we've, we've talked about you know that decision. Uh, and we're moving on from it now, and there's a, a job to be done at Monster. Uh, Monster, sorry, and um, I, I believe that they're 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 going okay, and that they can keep building. I definitely don't think that they're going to win the competition. Um, I just don't feel that they have the quality, um, and they're not playing with the quality. When you analyze the performance by Ulster and the skill set that they showed, you know, even Leinster, the way they pass the ball, the way they they make line breaks, their support lines. Um, if you take that little bit of an edge away from Munster up front, then I don't feel that they have much more in terms of a game plan. Um, and you need more than that when it comes to uh, the, the bigger knockout games. Just talking about the 
the replacement in in Munster uh, management set up a lot of talk of of Declan Kidney and and uh, Graham Roundtree. What what would you think of that Declan Kidney? The talk is director of rugby, him going in there, and then head coach being Roundtree. Yeah, I like Decky's a good, good good guy. Like he's good crack. Um, in terms of his coaching ability, he didn't really do that much coaching at Ireland. He was very good at uh, getting the the other coaches around him and underneath him to uh, do their job and do it very well. Uh, very good at delegating and making sure that the whole operation, you know, ran like clockwork. And I think that's uh, you know that, that's what he's very good at, and that's his expertise. So to go in as a director of rugby, you would think that. That's the you know the attitude and, and focus of the way that it's it's going to be run. Mm -hmm. um, but beneath that, you need a good head coach. You need a team that's going to be coached very well. Is Graham Roundtree going to be the head coach? Um, we'll, we'll wait and see. But uh, you know, there's been other candidates in Paul O'Connell, Ronan O'Gara, you know, um, Pendergast, a few other people. Na names been banded around, but um, nobody seems to want it. Uh, and not that that's a worrying thing. I just think it's it's a bit of an awkward time for Munster Rugby the the, the way they are, um, and uh, you know hopefully we we'll see some of those guys that I mentioned taking over the reins in, in the future at some stage with Munster. Mm, definitely, definitely, some some legends to come in there if the opportunity presents itself properly. Um, I suppose there's only one place to start from an Irish perspective when it comes to the round of sixteen in the Champions Cup, and that involves Leinster against Connacht. It's it's very very important for uh, for Connacht to put in a performance, but it's a big big task, isn't it? Oh, it's a huge task, it really is. Um, hopefully, Connacht get a load of players back again, um, strengthen their squad up. Uh, I think that you know Jack Carty's playing so well. Uh, Caelan Blade at scrum half, you know Kieran Marmion also at scrum half when he's on, superb. The centre partnership, Bundyaki's to come back in like he didn't play at the weekend against Stade Francais. Sammy Arnold has been brilliant as well. He's off to breathe next season. What a sign and that is. Um, you have Wooten on the wing, um, exceptional. Uh, Mac Hansen, you know, brilliant. Porch, um, you know, Tiernan O'Halloran. Like, it's just all these lads are playing with, you know, such energy uh, and confidence at the minute. So if they can secure some really good front football, Alexa Connor Oliver and Jared Butler, as I mentioned, can slow the ball down on the other side, a uh, defensive side, and, um, you know, put a bit of pressure. Like Leinster, if you give them time and space, they'll absolutely ruin you. Like they're really well. And some of the performances that I've seen this season, especially Ulster versus Leinster, the line speed that they brought to that game, putting Leinster under serious pressure, they like didn't know how to deal with it. And I know Connacht are more than capable of doing that. So, yeah, I don't think this is going to be a walk in the park for Leinster. Having to go to Galway in the, in the first leg will, will be tough. But if Connacht could set their stall out early, then you just never know. There could be an upset. Mm. Does You'd have obviously come across the fellow provinces in, in European competition, does it feel very differently, different like playing a, a, a fellow Irish side in the European competition compared to playing them domestically? Um, like, for me, as, as a former player, like, looking at it, like, the European Cup was the, you know, the top, um, top, place to be when you're playing your rugby that's the competition that you wanted to win the most like you know in 2012 when we got to the Heineken Cup final like if, if we had a miraculously <laughs> won that game against arguably one of the best Leinster sides of all time uh, like that would have went down as probably one of my biggest achievements in, in, the, in my career like um, you know the European Cup is so much history, uh, so many quality teams have won it in the past. So uh, to answer your question, I think it probably does feel different and it will feel different. Um, there's more riding on it. You will have uh, millions more people watching it. Um, and it's a brilliant opportunity as well for some of the guys here, maybe on the Irish fringes to, you know, get one over on, you know, Connor Oliver versus Josh van der Fleer. Like, I can't wait for that one. Uh, you know, Jared Butler against Jack Conan or Doris, that'd be be class Cody versus Sexton you know Hansen versus James Lowe like it's you know mouth-watering um, competition against each other for places so uh, yeah it, it's, it's gonna for sure it's gonna be a, a ding-dong battle um, it's over two legs and, and I love that little bit of format in the last 16 I think it adds, adds a wee bit yeah does it also add I suppose the um, 
the, the bigger picture. Obviously, Leinster get a, a far bigger budget from the IRFU than, than Connacht, but Leinster go out and put in a massive performance here. Does it put pressure on the powers that be in, in, in the IRFU to start to maybe readdress that a wee bit? I'm not so sure. Like, There's a big redevelopment plan for, for Connacht down in Galway with the stadium. Um, I know that stalled a little bit uh, just with COVID and everything else. So I think that'll be a priority, get more bums on seats down at the sports ground, um, make it a real fortress at home, um, continue to play the, the brand of rugby. There's also rumours going around that you know Andy Friend might not you know be a, a long-term coach for Connacht. You know, he might move on um, after his contract or he might sign again. But, you know, for, for the next, you know, in seven, five, six, seven years' time, I don't believe that Andy Friend's going to be the coach of Connacht. So it's about putting a, a longer term plan in place also um, for when he does go. Uh, keep bringing in you know quality players when you do have the opportunity to sign them. Um, you know the likes of Ulster uh, and Leinster. You know if if they need somebody like you know Al Alatoa, who you know a brilliant tight head prop to come in and you know when Tag Furlong can't play, he certainly you know can hold his own there. So it's about making good signings at good times, and the RFU will hopefully. Uh, help them out in, in situations like that, um, and you know, I, I don't I, personally. I don't feel that there is like. Do, do you remember like it used to be? Oh yeah, Connacht's the poor province of everybody. You know, or the poor province of the country. And um, when it came to rugby chat, like that, I think that's gone now. Um, and now there's all the you know. A couple of weeks ago, there was the slag and that Munster was the the poor province just because they were going through a bit of a. Well, they only had lost one game, like in a bit of a rocky patch. Um, and it'll quickly turn into Ulster, like if they have a couple of bad weeks. But honestly, I do feel that there's there's not much between all the provinces. Um, they're playing brilliant rugby. Um, they are a few. Um, I seem to have all four ticking really well, and it's vitally important that you invest uh, equally uh, as much as possible. Um, I know that that's not always uh, the case, but uh, you know, Connaught and everybody involved down there um, just need to keep marching forward. Mm, yeah. I- Ulster, of course, uh, have got the handy draw, I suppose, in the in the last 16, taking on the reigning and champions to lose. Granted, the French government and the uh, top 14 are arguing over the decision to award Cardiff the 28 to nil victory against the Red and Blacks uh, following the COVID outbreak in their camp. But how do you reckon both sides will be feeling going into that matchup? Yeah, like it's, it's going to be tough. Um, Ulster went away there. Uh, a couple of years back in the quarterfinal, was it? And, you know, got their pants pulled down. I you know Cheslin Colby was unbelievable, but as I mentioned earlier, he's not going to be there. Uh, he signed for Toulon, um, as I said, and yeah, I, I give him a, a good chance. Uh, I think it's important that they go away from home in the first game and, and you know, put, a, put up a fight. There's, there's no problem at all going away from home and getting beaten. Um, but there's a problem when you go away from home and get beaten by 20 points or 25 points, and then all of a sudden, you know, Toulouse can come to Belfast, and I've got the firepower and the physicality up front to be able to make a game a bit of an arm wrestle and, and slow it down and, and, and make it very, very tight. So it's important that Ulster do that away from home. Uh, and, and then when it comes to the King's Fan Stadium, you know, six losses and 60 matches over the last five years in all competitions, it's a hard place to come and get a result. So uh, they'll fancy their chances there. But yeah, uh, a game that uh, hopefully I'll be at and uh, you know get to enjoy it with all the the rest. I'm, I'll be a full house, so, you know. There will not be a ticket to be had, um, and a brilliant atmosphere. It's been 2014 was the last time Ulster had a home playoff game against Saracens. I was a part of that, like in um, you know one of the most uh, let's you know the atmosphere there was just. It was like a football atmosphere, like worse. It was just, it was really hostile. Um, and uh, I think the European sending off didn't help in the first four or five minutes of the match. But even still, hopefully there's something similar to come in Belfast in April. How important is that when, when you're playing a game at home, but the support get really behind, you get really vocal. Do, you know, Does it have a big impact on the players? I think it has an impact on the players, but it also has a huge impact on the referee. Um, I, you know, we've, so we've, we've seen it like where the ball's been in play and it just feels play, and you just hear the crowd on the TV going offside, offside, and then like the you know nothing said, and then like five phases later, 
the fans are offset and the next thing the referee sticks his arm out for, for being offside. Like, you know, if there was no crowd there, they would get away with it. So, yeah. like, uh, you know, they have a huge impact on, on some decisions, um, especially if the decisions go against them. They get fired up. And then, of course, you know, they get a decision and there's all that clapping the referee and whistling at them. Uh, you know, finally, we get a, a decision. So, yeah, there's there's huge pressure on the referees, like, um, coming uh the knockout stages i thought especially there in that cast harlequins game uh at the stoop refereeing was very very poor uh casts were very hard done by with a few decisions especially in the last half an hour of the match um and you know you just cannot let that those decisions be wrong in, in knockout games because uh there's no second chance there's no second bite at the cherry where thankfully you know both those teams are through to the the, the knockout stages this time around so yeah, uh, the crowd makes makes an awful lot of difference, Damien. I, I can imagine the the second leg you're going to be there just trying to g on the crowd as <laughs> you possibly can. But three pints in each hand, like <laughs> <laughs> definitely. Uh, so finally, then Munster take on Exeter, uh, who have been blowing hot and cold this season. Yeah. Uh, what do you think the the approach will be in the Munster camp? Yeah, again, like Exeter. A little underwhelmed by by them. Um, struggled last year, just at the tail end of the Gallagher Premiership season. Uh, you know, they were mixed matching with, with Hogg at fullback. He wasn't even getting into the start in 23. Now he finds himself in. Like, looking at the team sheet there at the weekend, I know they got beaten. Like, it was pretty pretty stacked. Um, you know, they're, they're usually so dominant uh, up front. Uh, and they haven't been of late, uh, and it's about teams f- figuring that out. And I think uh, a number of teams over the last year, in particular, have have, have found a way to beat uh, Exeter. Uh, you know, they're Ill, a little ill-disciplined as well. You know, giving away too many penalties, uh, some soft points, uh, and that's something that you know Baxter won't be happy with. Is, is the amount of points that they've conceded over the last year in each of their games. Um, and you know, we all know that Exeter can can score points, and you know. They can get a lot of uh, a lot of tries, but uh, I think Monster will will definitely try and you know go after a few of their weaknesses and and see how they get on. And you know with the Thoman Park um, crowd behind you, also it can really make a big difference. But uh, you know Sandy Park's a, a hard place to go as well, isn't it? Mm, yeah, although the Thoman the Thoman faithful will be uh, they they'll definitely be cheering on the referee to make sure they get the right decision they're renowned for it so it's uh, look, looking forward to a good one I suppose if Munster and Ulster both win it will be one hell of a, a quarter final clash yeah. mouth watering that one yeah we'd like that will be class like um, quarter final 2012 Ulster Munster like down at Thone Park um, yeah it was good good old days like good crowds <laughs> good standard of rugby you know Johan Miller was playing, John Afoa, Paul O'Connell, David Wallace, Ron O'Gara, like Stringer, like, you know, quality, uh, John Foa, yeah, mentioned him. So, yeah, no, uh, we, a, a couple of big clashes coming up, but you can't look ahead that far. No, I, I think that, you know, both Ulster and Munster are going to have it really, really tough in the last 16. And I wouldn't be surprised if, if both of them didn't make it, but equally, I, I feel that, there's such a big opportunity for both sides to, to progress in this tournament that they're not going to let it slip. Um, and the appetite for this European Cup, I, I feel, is is a little bit bigger by the Irish sides. Um, and we've talked about over the last decade about English sides, you know, all their focus is on the Premiership and, you know, it doesn't matter as much and everything else. But there's no relegation now in the Premiership this year. You know, there's not that. Uh, feeling of you know having to win every game to make sure that you, you stay up and you know resting players at certain times for other games and yeah I, I think it's going to be a huge a huge ties now in the last sixteen for for all the provinces. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be going to be great. We'll have to wait a few weeks for it, but it will be yeah. worth it. Uh, we return to the to the URC action this week, um, although it is overshadowed by the return of the Six Nations on Saturday week. But in terms of the provinces, Ulster are at home to Scarlets. Connacht play host to Glasgow. Munster face a trip to Italy, where they take on Zebra and Leinster are in Cardiff to take on the Blues. What are your predictions for this weekend's matches? Uh, yeah, like Dwayne Peel is back in Belfast for the Scarlets game. Obviously, former backs coach of Ulster. 
he'll know how this uh, this Ulster team are going to be playing. I'm not sure. Like I think Ulster need to rest a few players as well. It's been a big couple of weeks, so really interesting to see what the team sheet is there. Um, just reading today, Bradley Roberts, the the hooker for Ulster, he's now signed for the Dragons. Obviously, he's a, an international cap for uh, for Wales, so he's going to be moving over there. That's actually a big loss, in my opinion. He's a really good player. He came off the bench there at the weekend against Claremont for just for ten minutes and played quite well. So, um, yeah, loss, but like expect Ulster to get another win, another home win, definitely. Um, you know, Leinster and Munster. Munster, I just feel that they're going to get get the result uh, at Leinster. I feel like they're, they're just on a bit of a roll. The rugby that they're playing like is off the Richter scale at the minute. So, yeah, I'm going to back them. And Connor, like, why not? I think all four Irish provinces are playing really, really good. Um, and Connor, Maybe they welcome back a couple of lads from injuries. Maybe they rest a heap of players and, and send even more young guys out on the pitch to play. Uh, we'll have to wait for the team sheets. But, uh, yeah, there's lots of positivity amongst the Irish provinces at the minute. And if if uh, if they play their strongest teams this weekend, I feel it'll be four Irish wins. Mm. Is there a good chance they'll play their strongest teams? Obviously, there's going to be a lot of... As you said, sore bodies from the previous few weeks, and then looking ahead to what's coming, it it, it may not transpire. No, like uh, just looking at the fixture list, like um, there's there's now a game penciled in uh, in the URC. Um, you know, the night before Ulster are playing Connacht on, on the fourth of February, the Six Nations kicks off on uh, on the fifth, Ireland versus Wales that weekend, and there's. You know, just because of these games that were cancelled or sorry postponed during the, the Christmas and New Year window, then they got to be played. So, like, if there hadn't have been any COVID situation going into this weekend, I feel that the teams would have played their absolute strongest just to finish off the URC block with a good win, and then they get a few weeks off, a few weeks rest. Obviously, with the boys getting into the Six Nations camp, but now they have to back up, um, and Ulster and Connor have to back up against each other the following week. So. Um, it could be tough, uh, just 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 on the bodies and on the squad in general, especially if you're missing a few boys. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But four wins from four for the provinces will will, will be a great one. A nice little we'll take that. there. <laughs> we'll take it. <laughs> Davey, thanks very much for for no training, and we look forward to having you next week, where we'll be discussing all things Six Nations. A reminder that if you are having a bet on any sport this weekend, please do gamble responsibly. Visit gamblingcare.ie for more information. Enjoy the weekend sport. We'll be back next weekend with plenty more. Oh, 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 oh,